Simplifying your information management strategy is the key to unlocking your business. In manufacturing, this is a challenge. My name is Jeff Nepper with Flow Software, and our team is dedicated to helping you eliminate data silos, scale your analytics, and put the right information in front of the right people at the right time. Information management strategies are severely lacking across industry and manufacturing. For the last 30 years, manufacturers have focused heavily on data management, that is collecting and storing raw data across their operations, but they've neglected information management. That's transforming that raw data into actionable insights and usable information. It's more than just storing data, it's bringing multiple data stores together, adding context, adding process events, analyzing that data, and then distributing that information for decision support. Now, across industry, what has been occurring for the last 30 years is the grouping of data consumers and data producers. Data producers simply being those things that are storing data across our operation, data consumers, people, applications, and reporting tools that need access to that raw data. Now, we've been following the same type of raw data transformation processing for 30 years. That is, we pick an application, we connect data sources to it, and then we go through a process to turn that raw data into insight. Now, that process has been the same no matter what application we're using, whether it's a BI tool or Microsoft Excel. We connect and ingest data from the sources. We then go through a cleansing process, getting rid of outliers, bad data quality, things that are in or out of band. We add operational context. What was happening in our process during this time? What type of equipment? Who was the operator? What was our customer, the batch or the lot ID? We identify key process events. This was a downtime, this was a setup, this was a CIP. We were running um, under our allocated uh, specification, we had an alarm. Then we choose to aggregate all of the raw data that's been normalized, contextualized, and cleansed into some type of an insight or a key process indicator, KPI. Now we're able to validate the results, that is, check our math, and then distribute that information typically in the form of a report or a visualization within the confines of that application. Simple enough process, right? Well, unfortunately, we keep doing this process over and over and over again, and we continue to orphan the work of data integration inside of the applications that we're using to share the information visually or to disseminate the information across our enterprise. There's a huge problem with this. Distributing our data transformations is really expensive. We keep doing the same work over and over, and it's work that's costly. It requires a lot of code, intense scripting, which doesn't help to scale. Um, we don't get a lot of data governance or engineering governance when we spread the work out across multiple applications. That is, we can't control our business rules. We have a hard time controlling access, and we often are calculating the same KPIs, but getting different results. Never will we be able to scale well across our organization following this strategy, or really lack of a strategy. So what about using a unified namespace approach? Will that solve our problem? We can connect all of our consumers and our producers to a centralized broker or server, but really we're just focusing on real-time data. If we think about the process of transforming data into information, where does that actually live? Well, it's not going to happen at a real-time broker. Instead, we're just shifting that work right back where it's been over to the data consumer or the application layer. Again, no governance, won't scale, costs a lot of money and time. But there is a better way forward. 
We can centralize this process by connecting all of our producers to a model that will allow us to define how we treat our data and then distribute those results to all of our applications. Essentially, we're looking to centralize our data transformation instead of shifting it over to the application or the consumer layer. Now, by centralizing the data transformations, we pick up that strong engineering and data governance. We have a place for our subject matter experts from both IT and OT to collaborate. We end up with a no-code, low-code, templatized library of work that can be reused from project to project. And we're able to execute the data transformations early in our data stream, pre-processing data before it arrives at a data lake or in the cloud saves us a lot of money and it saves us a lot of time. So how do we take a unified namespace architecture and expand into this centralized data transformation architecture? It's by building a unified analytics framework. Now, a unified analytics framework means connecting my data producers, my archives of data, to a UAF. The UAF is then able to transform the data based on the rules of my organization before distributing it out to my applications or to other parts of my business, as well as sending this data in real time to my unified namespace. That means the information around my KPIs and my events as they've been processed are showing up in real time at my UNS. Of course, my consumers could also connect to the UNS for those real time updates if necessary. But what we find is that in most analytics, it's not that real time latest or last value that's adding value. It's the idea of the KPIs or the historic data aggregations that are adding value to the consumers. Now, to build a unified analytic framework requires three main components, and that's what I want to focus our conversation on today around how Flow Software offers those components for a UAF out of the box and ready to work with. The first of those components is an information modeling tool. Now, an information model is simply the definition of the key data that your organization needs to function or to grow or to transform. It's not all of the data across your organization, it's the key data. And the information model defines how that data is going to be created, how it's going to be managed, and how it's going to be distributed or used. All of these rules are written into an information model. Then the second component, intelligent execution engines, take the rules as defined in the model and then actually execute the processing of the data and the distribution and notification of the team members around that data and information. Finally, the third component, universal information access. So that on demand via uh, REST API or dashboards and reports, all of the organization can interact with the information um, essentially creating a self-service information repository. We followed this approach with AB InBev and saw firsthand how a data management strategy could turn into a mature information management strategy, empowering real-time decisions and reporting across the entire business layer. Within that organization, Flow is calculating over 300,000 unique KPIs spread over 35 different sites, but being centrally managed in one location and getting subject matter experts from both the OT and the IT domain interacting around the management of those definitions. So from an information modeling strategy, there are some key benefits and takeaways. You're going to be able to unify multiple OT data sources. That means time series historians, SQL databases, real-time data sources, web APIs, even manual data entry into one unified view. That unified view brings common namespace together. 
So it abstracts the difficult to understand functioning namespaces, say, inside of a tag historian, and exposes that data in a common sense naming structure that the entire enterprise will understand. Now your information model has a lot of flexibility. You could build it on a traditional ISA 95 hierarchy, or you could build it more flat to your own custom needs. It's your model to build as you need. You also get to bring in all of your operational context. This context is key for understanding the data as it gets used later on in the organization. Imagine shipping information to your data warehouse that's already pre-contextualized, so your data scientists have the insights of your operational subject matter experts at their fingertips ready to continue the processing and analyzing of that data stream. Your information model also contains the key rules around how you're going to cleanse data, what you're going to do if data is null, what you'll do if data is outside of band, how you'll clamp data, etc. It contains your rules for how you'll distribute your data, where will it go, when will it go, as well as all of your user base security, who has access to this, what groups will be able to interact with it. And to scale, we build this on top of templates so it can be used uh, across multiple parts of an operation or quickly taken from one line and expanded to other lines. So let's take a look at Flow's information model. What you see over on the left hand side is a um, model that is looking at specifically in this case the scrap that is happening on this line. I can see that we're inside of our company Acme Juice. We're working inside of our Midwest zone. We're at a site in Bentonville. I'm looking at line number one and I'm currently looking at my scrap use cases. As I look at my folder structure I see metrics or measures that are describing what I am measuring. So what's highlighted is a daily KPI that is my full value of scrap for the day. That full value is being expressed in gallons. If I need to take that KPI and expand on it, my flow information model gives me the ability to do that in a drag and drop interaction. So I use my flow KPI zone, drag the daily onto a weekly KPI, and then Flow will aggregate that daily total into a weekly sum. I can reposition the KPI within the model, and now I have a one-week KPI ready to work with. Let's take a deeper look at the full day KPI. As I open it in my center uh, workspace, my workbench, I'm able to see a full description of what that is, a universal format that's been governed, as well as a unit of measure that I've governed. Notice the backfill component. I don't have to just work with real-time data. This information has been backfilled based on the history that's available to me in my underlying databases. In this case, over on the right-hand side, I can see I'm connected to a plant historian, and that is actually the source of my underlying data. Now I've got context around this data to calculate based on multiple calendars. I might run a financial calendar. My start of year could be July. My quarters are aligned differently. My day is probably a traditional 24 hour day that starts at midnight and runs to midnight. But I'm also calculating this across a production calendar. A production calendar doesn't start at midnight. It starts at the beginning of first shift. Not only do I start my day at 6 a.m., but I break it into three shiftly schedules, first shift, second shift, and third shift. So now I can actually calculate uh, scrap not just across a day or multiple days, financial and production, but I can also calculate it across shifts. Below production is an event. That event has been defined so that I have the capability to look at a batch run and calculate scrap based on a batch run and break it out by the product. So I can look at my KPI for the full day as well as understand how much scrap 
did I create inside of each batch and what product was I making? I can expand my model attributes. This is where I write in or code metadata to this KPI. What was the piece of equipment that I was working on? What was the in-service date? Where is it physically located? What is the rate that I can expect from this piece of equipment? I can set limits for my scrap. In this case, I have created a manual piece of data called a target. My supervisor keys in the target of scrap for the day, and I will know how I'm performing, whether I stay under that high limit or not. Now, where does this daily scrap come from? There's a retrieval section of my model where I have linked this to the one hour scrap KPI. So instead of calculating the full day by asking for 24 hours of raw data, I am building on top of a KPI called one hour, and I'm summing that for the day. The information model gives me the ability to integrate this data and publish it out to many different sources, cloud platforms, SQL databases, Kafka streams, in this case, Snowflake. And I can define my schema here for my destination, making sure that when information arrives at any of those consumers or data sinks, that I'm matching the destination uh, format. I also keep a full dependency tree in my information model. What other measures, KPIs, calculations are dependent upon this KPI? And finally, of course, everything is auditable. That means that anytime I've edited or changed my information model, Flow keeps a full audit trail of that. So just a quick sample of an information model as constructed inside of Flow to help you understand the value to business that this provides. The idea here being that you're going to empower your citizen developers by defining a self-serve data accessible um, repository. You're going to govern your business rules and how you treat your data from a single and centralized location. You'll encourage subject matter experts to collaborate and you'll be able to reuse work over and over, making the solution highly scalable. Most importantly, we stay completely platform agnostic. We know that staying agnostic to these platforms that you have across your entire operation makes sure that you can always scale and focus on best of breed solutions elsewhere. The template library, our API driven flexible architecture and this no code, low code environment make sure that this will scale into the future, future proofing this technology. It's worked for many different food, beverage, consumer goods, minerals, mining companies across the world. And we know with full confidence that it will work with you, whether you're a discrete, a batch hybrid or a continuous 24 seven process. We've custom built flow specifically for manufacturing coming out of a system integration business ourselves. Frankly, we understand your pain points and your challenges because we've been there. So let's talk about the intelligent execution engines. This is really the models rules being um, executed with some type of smarts. That means that as you've defined how to structure your events and your KPIs inside of the model, our data engine will then watch the underlying data sources, validate when those rules should be applied and then execute the results. The data engine has to be able to understand after it's calculated KPIs, if any underlying data has changed. We know in manufacturing data arrives late. Data gets inserted long after the fact. Um, data gets modified recoded, recategorized, it's important that the data engine be able to recognize when that happens and then act accordingly. That means rerunning calculations as well as keeping a full dependency of all of the other calculations that would be affected in rerunning them. 
Flow's data engine versions every result. So even if it does rerun, you don't lose the original information. It sits there in the version history and your users can see it. The message engine makes sure that we publish information where your teams are already consuming that information. This is important for culture. We don't want to move someone's cheese. Uh, instead, where they're already working, we want to make sure that we're putting this newly calculated information at their fingertips. That means Slack channels, Microsoft Teams, email, SMS, SharePoint, um, where you're already consuming data, we want to meet you there. And then finally, the integration engine, how we get that data into other applications, other databases, cloud platforms, data lakes, back to SCADA systems or historians to MQTT brokers on trigger or on schedule as defined in the information model. Of course, this adds a lot of value to business. It creates absolute trust in the data because you can see and know that the engines have executed according to the rules written, and you can see those version histories. It makes sure that information is securely handled by passing into ecosystems that you are already using in trust, and it helps with the automatic data streams or data flows that IT is creating inside of your organization by empowering them with contextualized pre-processed information. Danone saw a 6% scrap reduction in just 135 days in one of their facilities because they were able to communicate quickly to their engineering teams when problems started to arise based on the calculations and the expressions that were written in the information model. Let's talk about universal information access. Now, this is how we make sure through dashboards and reports and a fully functioning REST API that anyone in your organization that wants to be able to get the data that's been uh, published in the information model or written back to Flow's database from the data engines, that they have full access to that information. One of the key benefits of the dashboard tool is that a user is able to interrogate all of the data, not just that is presented on the screen, but is underlying to the Flow system. And of course, with the REST API, not only can you search the information model, not only can you search the calculations that Flow has already performed, but you also can query the raw data as it sits in the attached data sources to Flow. That means if I need data from a MySQL and from a Postgres SQL database, as well as data that's living inside of two or three different historians across my operation, I can ask Flow's API to request the raw data from those underlying sources. And then of course I get back one normalized and standardized JSON payload to work with. Quite an advantage and one of the keys to the value to business. I'm empowering my data scientists and my data teams to have easier access and I'm getting away from having that traditional user-based dashboarding reporting tool, making sure that I can also capture manual data quite easily. Let's take a look at a flow dashboard. Um, what we're looking at is our Midwest zone, a scrap report for two different factories, Bentonville and Kansas City. As I can see at the top left corner, my current month-to-date scrap reduction efficiency that is how much scrap have I produced compared to my daily targets, is sitting at 84.5%. And then across my bar chart, I have total scrap produced each day for my light blue Bentonville and my dark blue Kansas City facilities. Looking at the table below are for both Bentonville and Kansas City, my scrap reduction efficiency is calculated each day. Also, my total scrap and the target, which are what are used to calculate my reduction efficiency. Now, we've color coded based on high or low scrap reduction efficiency. And if I take a look at the 11th of June, I can see that I've got quite a high scrap reduction efficiency. Now, within Flow, I have the capability to click 
on any KPI or any piece of information. And when I do that, I get a pop out that tells me more details or context around this. So I'm looking at the scrap reduction efficiency for the day, which was at 130.9%. And in the comments section, I see that I have an operator who has said, hey, Jeff, the target needs adjusted. And I've noted back in the comment field, yes, I will adjust. Now, this is all linked as an annotation to that KPI, full path, Midwest Zone, Bentonville, line 001, dot scrap, dot reduction efficiency, dot full day. Later on, if someone requests from the API that KPI for June the 11th, the comments will be right there annotated with it. This is important. Um, and also notice just how easy it is to understand the, what this information represents based on that name path. Much easier than, say, a historian tag name. All right, now with that selected, I have the capability now as, um, as a manager based on the user permissions to come in and, and look at my target adjustment. The target adjustment will link me to a dashboard that only a supervisor in this case can access where I can change or enter each day's daily target. So here's the June 11th. We can see that currently the value is set to 500 for daily target. And I can just click on that and re-enter the new target, in this case, 1,000. Clicking on the 1,000 brings up the bottom card. And in this case, if I use the history tab, I can see all of the previous versions of that value. So at one point, the goal, the target for the day, was set to 1,000. And then it was adjusted down to 500. Maybe, it, maybe we were scheduled for downtime, um, and then that didn't actually happen. So we had to come back in this case and adjust back to the original target based on what our production calendar uh, was actually allowing us to do. Now, when I do that, I can, of course, make another comment. This comment now gets appended to the target KPI. And it's there in case someone would ever want to look back and say, well, why was this changed? Again, annotated to that KPI for the 11th of June. As I've changed the target, Flow has also automatically tracked the dependencies and said, hey, I need to recalculate my reduction efficiency for the day. It's been recalculated based on the target, and the percent has changed from 130 to 65.5. I can see this change now as it updates onto the main report. There it is, updated and of course um, color coded from red now to green. And if I click on the 65.5, I can also look at the details tab and see what the definition of that expression is. It is taking the full day, it's dividing it by the target, multiplying it times 100 to create the percentage. The variables are represented, showing me the KPIs that are currently being used for that calculation here from June the 11th. That means that if I click on the 654.66, which is my scrap full day, I get a full list of each hour of what those KPIs were. And if I wanted to click on, say, each hour, Flow would drill down to the minutely time buckets if I was calculating by minute, as well as link me over to the original data source. In this case, I've built in links where I'm calling that tag for that day, or I should say that piece of equipment for that day, and I want to visualize the trends that are linked to that equipment inside of my historian, in this case, Canary. So from this single report, an operator, an engineer, a manager can drill down, investigate, interrogate, modify if permissions allow, Flow will recalculate, we can continue to interact with the data, drill down, understand the expression, understand the context of where this KPI is derived from, and even get out to another application here like Canary, where in one click, I bring up the trend screen for the 11th 
and the associated tags that I might want to look at to do some diag um, right here in front of me. Very powerful tool, not licensed, part of Flow's standard solution. It's through tools like this and workflows that Clover Dairy was able to use Flow and reduce their CIP reduction, or reduce their CIP time rather, by 20%. That means every single week for each line, they're saving eight engineering hours. That puts a return on investment, not in years or months, but in just weeks for what you would invest in a flow system. Well, here's how our strategy works for you. The information model allows you to connect, as I said earlier, to all of the different flavors of time series databases, all of your different real-time sources, as well as SQL databases. So that means that if data is already being stored, in this case, time series or SQL, and that could be uh, an Aviva historian like Pi or Wonderware, it could be a GE or Canary historian, um, Siemens, Rockwell, or any of the other dozens of legacy time series databases. It could be PostgreSQL, MySQL, Microsoft, Oracle, um, really any of the SQL technologies. And that means that all of the different operational applications like LIM systems, CMMS systems, EAM systems, um, anywhere they're storing data, Flow can have access. But it also means that when we don't have access to archives, where we would typically link and create tags and flow linked to that data, but we can also link to data that you're not storing. So for instance, real-time data coming from a broker or an OPC server or a web API or a Kafka stream or from um, any other source that you would need, we will then start to historize that data in Flow's own historian, as well as historize anything that you manually enter. Now, we in the information model handle how we're going to clean and calculate combining tags from multiple sources, normalizing all of the different data formats so that we get a normalized data table. We make sure that we have perfect timestamp normalization. That allows us to do row-based calculations and present all of your data in a wide table format, making it really easy to work with further downstream. Now we ask for your subject matter experts from both the IT and the OT space to come in and help contextualize the data, writing this knowledge into the information model before then identifying events and aggregating KPIs. Up until this point, Flow has not replicated any data that's already stored. That means that your time series historians are still the single source of truth for all things sensor related. Your SQL databases are a single source of truth for all of our transactions that we need. But now that we have new information, that is flagged events, context around those events, aggregated raw data into KPIs, now Flow will store that information in the Flow database while also providing it to operations on the dashboards that we've already discussed. From this database, universal information access via the API or automatic data flows synced through Flow's uh, data processing engine, the integration engine, making sure that we're now feeding contextualize information across the enterprise back to your unified namespace out to your bi tools to your data warehouse and such it's important to remember flow is not trying to replace business intelligent tools nor are we trying to disrupt a data warehousing or lake house architecture we're not trying to have you stop working with machine learning tools? No, we are simply helping to empower those existing strategies by, but shifting the information management and shifting the data transformation from being inside of each of those applications to a more unified and centralized location. So remember, a successful information management strategy is a journey. It's not a project. This is not a 
start today and then in 12 months we've digitally transformed our organization. No, it is a long-term strategy that will help to empower your operations. Empowering operations is key and paramount to this. We have to make the job of production managers, plant managers, engineering teams, and operators easier, not more difficult. We need to give them a tool that allows them to do their own reporting and self-service using drag and drop technologies, not asking them to engage in IT specific tools that are heavy in code and getting them away from Microsoft Excel, which we never get to incorporate into our data streams because it is just a black hole on an engineering laptop with very poor governance. We want to encourage collaboration around data and engineering governance. When we say we're calculating OEE, we want to ensure we're calculating it the same way. When we talk about things like production reports or quality scores um, or scorecards that we might build, we want to make sure that those definitions are universal and that the engineering work is universal. And context, 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 we cannot add enough context early enough in our data streams. That is really the key for empowering the next step of predictive and prescriptive analytics. So how do you start your next data project and move into this information management simplified journey? Well, you pick the use case. Whether you want to do OEE and downtime analysis, utility consumption, production forecasting, and who doesn't want to understand on Tuesday afternoon what they're likely to end with on Friday evening from a production forecasting, right? Um, scrap prevention or asset um, performance management, batch reporting, understanding cost of goods, quality assurance or manual data capture, flows, information model, execution engines, and universal information access give you what the tools that you need to be successful with all of these types of data projects and more. So no information management strategy. We know what that feels like. It's a mess. It's expensive. It lacks governance and it won't scale. But the right information management strategy that makes all the difference. It gives you a common place for IT and OT to collaborate and all of the tools that you need to be successful in your enterprise. We'd love to take some next steps with you. And if you'd like a consultation and demo of Flow, simply scan the QR code below and we can get started right now.